Hey, welcome back to another episode of Everyday Vegan Podcast. Today, I am thrilled to introduce my friends, Kim and Nelson Campbell from Plant Pure. Nelson is the executive producer, director, writer of the documentary film Plant Pure Nation, which was a 2013 movie that played in theaters in over 100 cities and aired on Netflix for over two years. His newest film, From Food to Freedom, will be released this year. He's also the founder and CEO of his food business, Plant Pure Inc., as well as the founder of Plant Pure Communities, a nonprofit organization committed to promoting plant based nutrition using a grassroots network of local support and advocacy groups called PODS. He's also the son of Dr. T. Colin Campbell, who is considered to be, by many, the science father of the rapidly growing whole food plant based nutrition movement. His wife, Kim, is the author of the Plant Pure Nation and Plant Pure Kitchen cookbooks and just released her third, Plant Pure Comfort Food, and has developed more than 350 amazing whole food plant-based recipes using no process oil. She is also the Director of Culinary Education and Development at Plant Pure, where she works with her husband, Nelson, building an organization that promotes a whole food plant-based diet. So welcome, Kim and Nelson. It's good to be here, Chuck. Thank Thanks for having us. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I have some questions of my own to get this started, but I also polled my fans and my Facebook groups, and they have their questions too. Uh, first, let's start with your new documentary, From Food to Freedom. What was the motivation behind creating it, and when can we expect its release? So <clears throat> there's an interesting storyline there. So we had an opportunity in New York City uh, to work with a very large network of independent physicians who work in four of the five boroughs and serve a Medicaid insured population. We had the opportunity to launch a, a citywide campaign with them. And they initially provided some funding for us to undertake that effort with them through our nonprofit and also to make a film, a documentary film documenting the campaign. And so the, the way that we were gonna get into the story to kind of springboard into that was to do a 10 day immersion, live in immersion program in Greensboro, North Carolina with a group of people who had uh, type two diabetes. And so uh, we went ahead and, and proceeded with that and filmed it and got some great results. And I won't go into the details of the internal politics, but it's, some of it's a, look, a little, little dirty, but uh, I'll just say that our partnership uh, dissolved <laughs> in New York and, and through no fault of our own. And um, so we lost the opportunity to do that and we didn't have that part of the story to film. So then we had to sit back and figure out, well, do we still have a film here? And we decided that we did, we had good footage from the immersion and we were able to utilize that to, to tell some interesting and dramatic personal stories, to make a very important point about nutrition, and then also to connect that to larger ideas around immunity, the pandemic and our government. And we, and we were able to do all of that, by the way, without getting uh, into any of the pandemic issues that have divided people you know, like vaccinations, masking. We don't, you know, we don't really address those issues in the film, but our focus is on food. And so we ended up uh, making a film about an immersion project, but it, we made it bigger by connecting it to those larger ideas. When can we expect to see that movie and what platform is it gonna be on? Um, so originally we thought we would put it on Amazon, or at least seek to put it on Amazon, because our current film, Plant Pure Nation, is on Amazon. Um, but we're actually reconsidering that. We may take a YouTube approach, uh, which gives us more flexibility to introduce people to uh, messaging that we think uh, is really important. So we haven't decided yet, Chuck, but I think sometime in the next few months and maybe even within the next month or so, it, it may be available. If people want to, to know when it comes out, I would encourage them to go to plantpurecommunities.org and subscribe to our newsletter. And I'll make sure I put all the leaks uh, associated with you guys down below. So were there any challenges? I think you mentioned a few during the production of making a movie, and if there were, how did you navigate them? 
there are always challenges, you know, in filmmaking, you know, every step of the way. Uh, every day that you're shooting something or writing something, you know, there are challenges. Um, I think for us, though, the biggest challenge is what I just shared, that we, sh we got all this footage of this incredible program that we delivered in Greensboro, but we filmed it with the intention of that just being, you know, maybe a 10 minute segment of a much larger movie. And so when we filmed it, uh, we filmed it for that purpose. Um, had we known that we were going to make a full film out of it, we might have uh, done some additional filming that we didn't do, but we got enough that we were able to make, I think, a, a really great movie. But that was the challenge as, you know, tr taking what we had and turning what felt like a failure at that moment and, and you know, turning it around and making it a success and making a full film out of it. So, and I think um, the challenge also was how do we tell the story that we told without being partisan or being uh, perceived as being partisan one way or the other uh, and without delving into those topics that have so divided people relating to the pandemic. And that was a challenge. And I think we were successful there as well. Okay. Were there any particularly inspiring or eye-opening moments that you'd like to share during the production of the movie? Uh, I think the ending of the immersion and <laughs> just seeing, seeing the effect of all of that, of, of that experience on the participants. And I should point out too that Kim was an integral part of the film, because as we all know, this idea, you know, it's, we can talk about the nutritional science, but it's really all about the food. And you know that too, Chuck. And so Kim and a chef friend of ours did the meals for all 10 days. And every recipe that people had is a recipe that, that she had developed. So that was key. Uh, what do you hope viewers will take away from the movie? The power of food and, um, yeah, the power of food and, and hopefully people feel inspired to share that with the people around them. Okay. So with the movie on your website, you now have these meal starters that I've been personally playing with and they are amazing. There's eight of them, a burger, a cheese, a peanut, a gravy, enchilada, coconut curry. I'm going to actually make the mayo today, Kim, and uh, a cookie mix. So whose idea was it to create these things and who actually came up with the recipe slash formula? Well, I'll say Kim and I kind of conceived the concept, but I'm going to hand it over to her to explain how the products work. She created all, all of them. And, and you, by the way, Chuck, we appreciate the help that you provided as well Definitely. early in the process. Definitely. Um, well, one of the things that Nelson wanted to do was to, to make, to simplify the cooking process, because a lot of people think when you go plant-based, it's complicated, there's weird or strange ingredients, which there really aren't. Um, but we wanted to sort of be a, an assistance in the kitchen. Well, you, you always call it the, the key. Um, or culinary key. Culinary key, which is kind of a cool way to, to refer to it. But instead of getting out all your spices and your, you know, your nuts and your seeds and Add, you know, all those things that add flavor to food, we decided to put them in a pack and call them meal starters. So, you know, I said to Nelson, it all starts with a sauce. Everything starts with a sauce. So if you could create these beautiful sauces and then we could build recipes around them. So that was the challenge. And that's when we got you involved, Chuck, was taking, you know, like the cheese sauce and coming up with recipes to support that cheese sauce. Um, that was challenging, but fun. So I think we have 50 recipes in our cookbook um, on the online cookbook that goes with the meal starter. So you can make most of these recipes in under eight ingredients. Um, some of them are a little bit more, but, I, you know, six to eight is or even, even less, even fewer, e even less. Fewer. Some of them are even less. And if you just want to use the meal starter by itself as a cheese sauce, you can certainly do that, too. Yeah, I, I would say that um, they can be used as sauces, standalone sauces, but really the way to think about these products is more of a meal base because uh, some of these packs, they just kind of get absorbed into the recipe to the point where you, you know, you can't really tell it was a sauce. I mean, it just, 
it's, it's not like you make you make it and then you pour it over something although you can do that right i mean some examples um i made a bean soup with the cheese sauce i made a new england chowder with the cheese sauce that has more ingredients in it um we did some uh breakfast casseroles using the cheese sauce so it's it's a cheese sauce but it's it's so much more than that yeah and like that that dumpling dish that, oh, that with the, the gravy, gravy pack. the gravy, gravy pack. pack the gravy um, i like all by itself you know you just whisk it add some water whisk it cook it and it's it makes beautiful gravy um i showed last week that uh, on my blog and my youtube that the burger pack it doesn't have to be just burgers you can make crumbles with it and you can make that into the sloppy joes i did or tacos or stuff stuff like that so they are very uh adaptable how do you think they will support individuals in adopting a plant-based diet? I think it's huge because it's half of, you know, it's, it's half the work. You know, I always tell people, get everything out. Well, there's, I don't want to say there's tons of ingredients in the pack, but all those things in that burger pack, for example, people don't have to get out. They can just decide, okay, I'm going to add a little bit of broccoli to it or a little bit of spinach or whatever they want. But to me, um it's sort of cooking for dummies <laughs> it really is it's well the other thing i think that's important about this product line is as our volume goes up our costs are going to come down so uh hopefully over time we can pass along some cost savings to our customers and as kim said this product concept is like a culinary key because it makes it easier to cook from scratch. Definitely does. Yeah, and I think, you know, because sometimes we go out to eat, maybe we buy products from the store that are already prepared or partially prepared. If we're able to, to cook from scratch most of the time, you know, that's gonna help people to reduce their food bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see. What makes plant pure meal starters different from any other plant-based meal option on the market? I think it's versatile. You know, uh, if, if you get a mac and cheese, all you can do is macaroni and cheese with it. If you get, uh, and I don't buy those, but there's a ton of them out there with their, you know, the meal's already done for you. You just add water or whatever. But this one, you can do so many things with it. Um, and we, we use them all the time. I have a big box full of them. And I'm, I'm always grabbing one and thinking, well, I don't have to make half of the recipe. I can just use the pack. So um, they're just versatile. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Kim, the versatility. And by the way, it relates to something that you just said, Chuck, about how you were using these to actually create some new recipes. And we're excited about that because we want our customers to take these packs and come up with their own recipe ideas. And, and by the way, if you do that and you have something exciting, share it with us because we'll take a look at it. You know, and in fact, that includes you as well, Chuck. We'll take a look at it and- We'll steal it. No, and, and we, we might, our, our, yeah. yeah, we can upload uh, those good recipes to our online cookbook. I will keep playing with them. I, I have a bunch right down here. Uh, let's see, where, so where can people buy them? Uh, online at our website, plantpurenation.com. Okay. Is there a shelf life? There is. Uh, we don't know exactly what it is, but it's well into the future because, you know, these are professionally packed and they're dried ingredients. So I don't think anyone should have an issue with that unless they're, you know, buying them for, <laughs> for what they think might be end times and they're storing them someplace. <laughs> I will, I will say because we do use some cashew powder or almond powder or anything that has fat in it, um, keeping it in the, in your refrigerator or in your freezer. I mean, I buy soy curls all the time. You don't have to keep them refrigerated, but I do because anytime, anytime something has a little bit of natural fats in it from the nuts, it can go rancid. So I think I, I keep my flour in the freezer because there's fat in flour, believe it or not. So it can go rancid. So I think I would recommend that people do that. I don't have a big enough freezer. Um, so are there any plans for any new flavors coming out? Oh, <laughs> Nelson keeps telling me to, to make some more. We do, we've come up with some other ideas, but um, 
Mm -hmm. For now, we're we're in slow mode. But yes, I think eventually we'll we'll add a few more of them. Yeah, what one of the things we want to do with this line is to continually innovate. So right now we're looking at making changes that will drive down the cost. So two of our packs um, in future production runs, the cost should be falling significantly based on changes that we're making now. Um, but we also um, are interested in adding to this line. And if we see some products maybe that aren't selling as well, we also might drop um, a product here or there. But we want to continually innovate as we go based on customer feedback. I went through I went through my cookbooks and a few other cookbooks and said, you know, what it, what are the core sauces that would support a lot of these recipes? And so that's where I start. That was my starting point. Um, the cookies you can make muffins with them, or you can do a fruit crisp with it. Um, I don't think you can do pancakes because it'd be too sweet. But it was just I just went through recipe by recipe and thought, well, what what pack would supplement this? Um, so I, I used my own my original recipes um, to start with. Okay, so this is from a friend of mine in the uh, my support group. When can Canada expect to see them? Well, you know, this is a question that, that oftentimes comes up. So we are interested in bringing these to Canada. We actually did have someone here recently who ordered from Canada. The problem is the shipping was extraordinarily high. Um, I think to really service that market, two, two things. One is we have to make sure we conform to the uh, labeling requirements. And, um, and then secondly, we probably should have a fulfillment partner in Canada, so we can store and ship uh, from that location in Canada. And so, aren't, they, aren't there nutri nutrient label labeling requirements are a little bit different? No, well, they are so different. That, but that kind of puts a challenge there. Too. Yeah. So uh, we have some work to do on that, but eventually would like to bring these to Canada. Okay. So that's it for my questions. Now the fan questions. So here we go. Uh, I would appreciate if you would ask them their thoughts about oil. Thank you. I'm a big fan of Plant Pure. So maybe I'll, I'll answer that because I've, I've heard my dad talk about this so many times. Um, of course, it, you know, I think most people know my father's doctor. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning, Chuck T. T. Colin Campbell, and he's his background is nutritional biochemistry. So, you know, he's not trained as a physician. His training is entirely different. It's the deep science uh, behind this and the nutritional biochemistry. And so he did a lot of the pioneering uh, deep research to validate the health benefits of this idea. And he talks about this fat issue uh, a lot. Um, refined oils are not good. You know, these unsaturated refined oils, they're very reactive in the body. They cause inflammation. Whole fats from, you know, from whole foods are good. Um, Obviously, you know, we don't want to eat those foods in an artificial manner. Uh, you know, uh, nature didn't give us a bag of shelled peanuts to gorge out on. So, you know, we don't want to do that. But modest amounts of those foods, it's actually essential to our health. Um, there are things in those foods that you can't find anyplace else. And so, uh, it's important to distinguish between refined oils and whole fats. Um, one other thing I'll point out about that is there's a lot of misunderstanding as well around saturated fat. So a lot of people are concerned about coconut, for example. Um, and this frustrates my dad to no end because there's just so much confusion and misunderstanding. Because most people who talk about this have no training in nutritional biochemistry. They don't understand the basic chemistry involved. Um, saturated fat, it's, it's, it's fully saturated, so there are no chemical bonds that make it reactive as it, as it goes through the body. Um, it's unreactive when it's in the body, so it tends to kind of pass through. It's actually the unsaturated oils, the unsaturated fats that are so inflammatory and so reactive in the body. The reason that saturated fat got a bad rap is because typically it comes in animal products. So you see it in milk and meat and those kinds of products. But the real culprit there is the animal protein. So, you know, it got a bad name because of the, 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 the carrier uh, of it. But 
you know, coconuts, for example, have some saturated fat, but it's, it's just perfectly healthy. Well, and two, I will say, if, if you're eating cans and cans of coconut or bags of Costco nuts, that's a problem. <laughs> but you, if you eat them the way nature presents them. So I keep a bag of cashews. I keep nuts in my freezer. Um, and we, we use them, I don't want to say sparingly, but we don't use them to excess. And I think it's the same thing with coconut. It comes, you know, the way nature well, presented it. Yeah, it, people forget, and my dad makes this point all the time, that this is the optimal diet because it comes from nature. We come from nature. And it would be, a, I mean, could you imagine our ancestors walking through the forest, which would have been littered with nuts and seeds and avocados and coconuts, walking through the forest with a fat meter, <laughs> you know, measuring the fat content. Um, of course, that didn't happen. Um, you know, those, those foods are plentiful in nature. So they're natural to our bodies. Again, though, you, you, you want to eat them in a natural form. Well, and when they're paired with a lot of sugar and salt, uh, it, 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 people overeat, right? They indulge. So just, you know, being really mindful of that, making, you know, making cookies, for example, or pies that are just loaded with sugar and nuts and seeds. And that, that's not really, I mean, we do it now and then. We, we, we do it here. We'll have desserts, not to say we don't have dessert, but it is a treat. Right. So I think it's important to differentiate. You said coconut as a whole plant, but not coconut oil, which is refined. Exactly. Those refined oils, uh, most of which are, of course, are unsaturated, are, are reactive in the body and inflammatory. They're, they're, they're not good for us. Okay. Uh, let's see the next one. And this is a very good one. Tell them thanks for all their work and for the meal starters and ask if they would ever think about freeze dried meals for backpackers. So like fettuccine, lasagna, mac and cheese, beans and rice, soup, et cetera. I certainly think that we sort of have the recipes and the, the, the foundation for that, but it's kind of, kind of like the question about the Canadian market is something that we'll have to work up to. Okay. And this next one, we'll see. I've had several people over 70 years old tell me that they need to eat high protein. They are saying as you get older, you need more protein. Can you guys clarify this? I'm familiar with what the China study says, and she's a graduate of the T. Colin Campbell plant-based nutrition course, which taught us that if you eat enough calories, you're getting enough protein. But I've never heard this before about once you reach a certain age, you need more. And I've heard it from quite a few people now. Any ideas? You know, Nelson's father and I talk about nutrition a lot. Um, he's sort of my go-to all the time. And I have never heard him talk about that. Have you? No, I haven't. And I don't think there's any really merit to that. I, I think I think what happens, and, and this is kind of me speaking based on my own research, I guess, but Maybe my dad would agree. Um, as we get older, our muscles tend to waste away naturally. Um, we are not as active. We're not using our muscles. And as we age, it's part of the aging process. So I think that actually the best thing that we can do as we get older is to continue to exercise and, and not just do aerobic exercise, but also some resistance training, which anyone can do. Um, I know a lot of people don't like to do that. Um, you know, I, 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 I do that myself and, you know, go to the gym uh, maybe four or five times a week. Um, I, I think that as we get older, it's important to continue using our muscles because I think that'll help to offset the, the kind of wasting that happens um, as we age. I also want to add that I think as people get older and I've observed my, my own mother, who's 89, and your parents, I think as they get older, they eat less. Um, not yeah. always, but for the most part, I think they eat a little bit less because they're, maybe they're not as active or whatever. So what, what you do eat should really matter. So if you're only eating two meals a day or you know, you're not snacking, then those foods that you eat should be, you know, n not junk food, not empty calories. 
um, not oil, <laughs> certainly, but you know, healthy, healthy, whole food, plant-based meals. We, we talked about this in my, in my support group the other day. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to uh, the other side of Portland to meet up with some friends of mine. And fun fact, his wife used to actually work for Dr. Medugal. So she was one of the editors, I think, on one of his books. But they've been friends with the Medugals for a long time. We met, I think, at a potluck or something. We've been friends ever since. So tomorrow, my wife has a friend coming in from England and visiting her friends, which happen to live in the same complex as my friends. So we're going to go together and see our friends. He's just turned 80, and he posted on his birthday that he had just finished his five-mile run, did his 300 push-ups and 100 sit-ups or squats and something else, and he was going to go off to the gym for some uh, resistance training at 80 years old. And so he's an animal. He really is. He's a fun guy, too. Yeah, I've seen uh, older fellas in the, in the gym like that and women as well. Um, who who are doing their workout they look great and uh, i don't know how how many of them are plant-based maybe <laughs> maybe not very many but i think whether you're plant-based or not i think as we get older i think it's really important that we continue using our muscles they are plant-based my friends I, I i don't know if they have a pod a plant pure pod but they have something similar that they do in their retirement complex so um Another question, what do you guys eat in a day? Well, what do we eat in a day? It, it varies so much because I'm always doing things with recipes for posting or, you know, the, but what's a typical day? So what do we have for breakfast this morning? I had, this is really typical for me, I had a English muffin, all whole grain, with a little bit of peanut butter on it and a dish of berries. And you had... Well, I tend to have this, the same thing. Uh, sometimes I mix it up, but and I, I, I usually, oh, go ahead. as I say, I usually have a grapefruit or some other citrus and then maybe some berries or bananas. And so I'll have a, a, a bowl of a variety of fruit. And then I'll take uh, just a modest size handful of nuts and seeds and put them on the top. And that's, that's the, that's all I have for the day. But I combine those two things every morning. And then for lunch, we eat leftovers. So whatever we had for dinner last night is what we'll have for lunch. Um, and then a lot of times we'll have a salad or side veggie with those leftovers. I make a big salad every week, just a huge salad with all kinds of veggies in it. And then I make a salad dressing. And so we always have salad almost at every meal, um, some vegetables. But every meal is a little different. Um, tonight we're having Pollock paneer because Nelson said he needs more greens. <laughs> well, it's just been a it's been a few days since we had some. So we had Brussels sprouts last night. All right, you, yeah, we yeah. did. That's true. We had spoiled. Brussels sprouts. Yeah, but then we have some healthy snacks too. Like late morning, I'll always go in there and get a pretty good sized carrot. Do you food prep? Um, no, I don't. I only I only food prep if we're having company. Um, and I don't want to spend hours in the kitchen before they get there or it's a holiday or something, but I, I, I pretty much cook as I go. Yeah. Uh, can you, Kim, suggest pantry friendly meals for when I can't go to the store for fresh produce? Something with a meal starter? Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I don't want to cook. Okay. So this is a really typical meal for us. If I don't want to cook, I take my potatoes and I bake a couple of russet potatoes I steam some broccoli maybe, um, and then I maybe open a can of beans if I'm really lazy, or I have some salsa and guacamole, and that's dinner with our salad, because we always have a salad, but that, that that's a really typical, I don't want to cook meal, because there's really very little to it. And if you had a meal, if you had a meal starter, you could make the gravy, or you could make the cheese sauce. Yeah, that's what I was to say, Chuck kind of set us up with that question. Yeah. <laughs> We, we, we would recommend a meal starter. Yeah, because yeah. that's what we do. Um, so here's a strange question. What is the fat percentage you expect to maintain on this diet? Well, again, you know, we're providing this the flavorful centerpiece of your lunch um, and maybe your dinner or just your dinner. Or it could be your lunch and dinner. 
But when you when you consider the fat content of a meal, you have to take into account two things. One is the fat coming from a refined oil, which is bad. Two is it coming from a whole food source, which is good. And then you have to take into account everything that you eat over the course of the day. So, for example, you know, maybe you have some fruit in the morning and, you know, and it's fat free or you have veggie snacks between meals. That's fat free. You have salads. You know, maybe that's fat free. You have a side veggie and then you have your your flavorful centerpiece. So you so, you know, you have to look at the whole daily, the whole day's consumption. So um, I, I get confused with the fat percentages because at, at what point do we do we talk about, oh, the calories should be t the total fat calories should be less than what, 15, 20, 10, wh whatever it is. Are you talking about the, the bowl of peanuts that you had or are you talking about the peanuts and the salad and the veggie burger that you had? Are you talking about everything you have in a day? I think it gets it's really sticky and. I have never known your father to count his fat grams, his fat percentages, his protein intake. Again, I think it's important to look at the whole picture, how, many, how much you're eating in a day. I mean, I have a couple of tablespoons of peanut butter every day that has 100% of its calories from fat, but that throughout the whole day, it's still going to be less. Yeah. I guess frustrated with that. Yeah, that's the key is to just make sure you're eating healthy fats yeah. and, and that even though that even with that, though, that you're not overdoing it. So, you know, having a modest handful of nuts and seeds like I do with my breakfast is fine. Um, having a, a salad dressing that utilizes a few cashews and making your dressing, that's fine. You know, utilizing a recipe that maybe uses some nuts and seeds is fine. What you don't want to do is to sit down and take a bag of shelled or a can of shelled nuts and sit there and eat and eat and eat. That's not that's not how nature presented them. But there's way too much fixation and focus on in our community with all the various rules that you can only you know you have to have this number of servings of greens or you have to have just this this amount of fat and, and nothing more. You you can't have a crystal of salt or you can't have a crystal of sugar. It's, it's why we don't have a plant-based world, because as long as we keep thinking that way, we're never going to bring people into this, uh, into this way of life. Mm, okay. I like that. Uh, let's see, where did I leave off here? I would be interested if Kim and Nelson know of any public policy that we can help with, like health, whole food, plant-based school lunches, hospital food, farming policy, growing veggies instead of animal feed, stuff like that. Well, I think my passion has always been to get into the schools because if you if you think about what the kids are eating from the, the free and reduced lunches that they're getting, it's it's really garbage and, and the milk that they're feeding kids. So if I, if I could be passionate about something, that would be my, because I, you know, I used to teach and I saw what the kids were eating from breakfast almost all the way to dinner and it, it was not healthy food. And I think it starts there. Yeah, it's, you know, as we, sh as we showed in our first film, Plant Pure Nation, in the current film, um, there are powerful interests that are uh, supporting the current status quo. And, the, you know, the very worst thing that we do, uh, I think, from a policy standpoint, is subsidize the production of unhealthy food. And if it wasn't for government subsidies, the cost of a burger would be way higher than it is, and and the consumption would fall off a cliff. We so have mandated uh, milk cartons in schools. Either. Yeah, they always end up in the trash can because kids yeah. don't drink it. Yeah, I think I think it's at the moment. You know, that's I, I like the intent there, but it's I'm not as optimistic about working from the top. That's why I always say I think we need to work in our communities because regardless of whatever the government does. Uh, we can still ourselves, we can live plant-based and we can help our friends, family, neighbors do the same. Exactly. Exactly. Um, concerning the pods, what activities and or events or classes do you feel have been the most successful and in initially attracting the veggie curious and how do you keep them and support them in becoming whole food plant-based? So I can talk about, I can talk about mm -hmm. our pod. 
uh, I started a pod here in our local town and, and I merged it with the Chapel Hill pod. And some of the things that have been really successful in our pod is we've had some speakers. Nelson's dad came. That was that was pretty big success. But we, we had we had somebody come in and talk about gardening. We've had different topics that people are passionate about. The one underlying topic that people enjoy are the cooking classes. We've had Kathy Hester come in. I've done some cooking classes. Um, this week, we have one of our members doing a class. And the best part about the pod meetings are is all the food that's there. It's literally like a Thanksgiving spread. So people who are new to the plant-based diet will come in and just see the, the multitude of foods that we ate eat and then the social part of it's always really nice just connecting with like-minded souls so mm -hmm. that's fun cool so people actually see that we don't eat rocks and twigs and grass and leaves and yeah um here's another one how can we get doctors and healthcare systems to embrace and promote the plant-based lifestyle uh you know what are running campaigns uh Pods teaming up with plant-based doctors from the hospitals to offer support and community to their patients. I don't know, kind of a random question, but any any thoughts? I think as as patients, when we go in to see our physician, you know, we shouldn't be shy about sharing this information and maybe sharing some resources uh, for them to check into. So as patients, we can help drive, you know, their education. Um. I know that medical schools are starting to teach a little more of this, but but by and large, it's still still neglected. I think the the biggest issue with our physicians, though, is the structure of our healthcare system and the financial incentives that are at play there. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen over the past uh, decades is an increasing centralization of healthcare into these big corporate healthcare systems. So the independent physician is increasingly uh, sort of becoming a thing of the past. Um, a lot of these physician practices have been bought up by these big systems. And those systems, they're motivated to generate as much volume of business as possible because they're carrying a tremendous amount of clinical infrastructure. So you think about it, the, all the hospitals and the equipment and all of the fixed staff that they have, they've got tremendous cost. Oh, yeah. yeah, and so anything that comes along and threatens to reduce their top line revenue is something that they're not interested in. And I've had this experience multiple times with healthcare systems where they'll pay lip service to this idea because they sort of have to now. But when you talk about fundamentally reform, you know, introducing reforms into those systems, all of a sudden, the door shut, and it's and it's and it's because of those financial, those perverse financial incentives. So I'm going to team tag that because it's it's the system itself, and I do want to say that you know we have many friends and family members who are physicians, and I think physicians get very frustrated with the general population because they walk into the doctor's office. I recently just went in, and they you know. Don't take, don't ask for all the drugs. Tell them, you you know, you, you don't want those prescriptions. Is there anything else you can do? I think that doctors would embrace that. I think they're looking to be more into preventative care. I you know, I think they get tired of just writing prescriptions. Yeah, that's... I, I think there's so many good doctors out there. There, there are, there are a lot of good doctors who are, are becoming aware of this idea, who are very interested, because most people who went into medicine did it because they wanted to help heal people. So when they learn this, they tend to get excited about it. not always, but many of them do. And, and that's why I, I spoke about the system and the financial incentives. That has nothing to do with the doctors. Yes. The doctors are caught in the systems. And many of the physicians are leaving. They're leaving medicine, which is really sad mm -hmm. uh, because they're, fr they're frustrated with it. Yeah, we, we've met so many good physicians along the way who are open to this and embracing it. Um, but somehow we have to change the financial incentives. And I think one way to do that is to go to do what we can to, to go back to the idea of the independent physician practice. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to somehow empower physicians to deliver care uh, independent of these big systems. Are the new food packets gluten-free? Or if not, will you be coming out with any gluten-free ones in the future? 
that none of them, well, let me just say, if they're not made in a facility that's gluten-free, you can't put the term gluten-free on it. So I don't believe they're made in a facility that's gluten-free. However, there are some packs that are gluten, like the cookie pack is gluten-free, but I don't know if it, it, it can't be certified gluten-free. Um, the burger mix is not gluten-free, but the peanut is, the enchilada, I believe, is. Yeah, you can, the you can just look at the ingredient the list. Ingredients. But if you're, mm -hmm. if you're just gluten sensitive, I would look at the, the ingredients. If you have celiacs, then I would probably say you, you can't, you can't use these products. Okay. One thing I will point out, if you're new, if you're new to a plant-based diet and you're kind of, or even if you're doing it, but you're not doing it well, and you're trying to work toward a more perfect form or not perfect, it's not a good word, but you know, a, a healthier form of it. Um, what you may find if you, if you tend to have some gluten sensitivity is that that will diminish or go away the better your diet. And my dad talks about this a lot, that whether it's gluten or other food allergies, those things do tend to, at least in many people, not all people, but diminish or go away the healthier, uh, the healthier your diet, the healthier you are. And you know, a lot of the recipes that I developed in the newest cookbook are gluten-free. And I did that because so many people were asking but is it necessary for health? Definitely not. In fact, Dr. Greger did a, just did a video on that. So I was thankful that he did that because I don't think if you're eating a, a diet that has gluten in it, that's not any less healthy. There are some people who truly have sensitivities yeah. to it. Okay. Kim, are you going to start up your cooking demos again soon? Um, you know, we, we've been taping them and editing them, editing all the fat out. So yes, the answer to that is yes. We're just not really sure where we're gonna put them. Um, plant your communities or plant your nation. I think we have four in the can already. So that's my goal is to do. Well, the, no, the, this is a plant your communities. Oh, uh, plant your um, communities, okay. I, yeah. I'm sorry, I get confused about that. But, um, but yes, we have videos that have already been taped and ready to show. Okay, last question. A recipe calls for sesame oil. What can I use to give that rich, smoky flavor without the oil? All right. I like that question. Smoke. smoke. Yeah. To, well, if it calls for sesame oil, um, yeah, some people think it's okay to use a little bit of sesame oil to season it, but you're going to have to be really careful, like a teaspoon. However, I don't have oil bottles in my house, so I would toast the sesame seeds because when you toast them, you bring out the flavor and then you can grind them and add them to whatever you want. And you'll, you'll get that really nice sesame flavor. And what was the other part of the The question? smoky. Oh, the smoky. I use smoked paprika or liquid smoke. Okay. I, I'm not sure. They said it's the smoky flavor of sesame oil. Unless they burned it. I don't know if it tastes smoky or not. But You can, you can toast those sesame seeds. Just put them in a pan, turn it on high, and move them around. It doesn't take very long, so you don't want to do it for very long. And then you could actually do a whole bunch of them, put them in your little coffee grinder or whatever. Hopefully you're not using it for coffee grinding, but for spice grinding. And then you should get that really nice toasty sesame flavor. Okay. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate this. You have anything else you'd like to say? Well, thanks for all you do, Chuck, yeah. uh, to help get the word out. And, um, and you know, you know, we appreciate what you do. I, you know, I reached out to Chuck and I'm going to tell everybody why I did. Um, first of all, I, I was intrigued with his story, but Chuck does a lot of sort of comfort. He takes traditional recipes and makes them plant-based, which is what I like to do. And it's how I've always done it. So I've always been sort of drawn to the brand new vegan recipes because I think they're they're, they're mainstream and they're, they're comfort food. So I just had to say that, 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 that's how we kind of came into well, I think, vegan. Yeah. Well, what, what you're referring to is when we started working on these meal starters, we thought we'd go out and get some outside input and opinions and participation. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, I, I said to Kim, I said, well, who out there, you know, is put, is cooking some great food and, Chuck and that, and Kim mentioned you Chuck. And so that's how, how we started talking to you. I am still honored that you guys reached out to me that day. And um, I'm glad you did because even though it may not have played out as we thought, 
I made some really good friends and I'm thankful for that. And, uh, I'm still rooting for you. And we got these meal starters we got to push. So I hope people get out there and check them out. Again, I'll put all the links down below for the websites, Kim's Instagram or Facebook, YouTube, and the meal starters, uh, of course, with the cookbook. And with that, I guess we're done. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I will say just one more one more quick thing, Chuck, I just realized. You know, I should probably let folks know that that this what we're doing with these meal starters and our plant pure foods is part of a bigger strategy and bigger vision to help support a grassroots strategy. And so, you know, we're trying to get these, we're trying to get our business to a stable place and successful place so that we can have the resources that we need to do, for example, more media, you know, more filming and to, to do things to help support the pod network. We also want to use these meal starters at, down the line to support outreach and the under-resourced communities waiving our profit margin so we can make you know this way of eating the most affordable way to eat in those communities so so this is about more than meal starters in a business um we're actually not comfortable as business people <laughs> we're really motivated by this higher social mission so you know we hope that people will check these out and when they do to know that they're they're supporting that larger vision and if you like them, mark it for us because we're not very good at that. <laughs> we need, that's a department that we've actually been lacking a little bit. Yeah. So. I understand that completely. So thank you, Kim and Nelson. Excellent interview. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, if you guys like this type of content, the interviews with the celebrities like Kim and Nelson or just everyday people like me and you, and you want to see more, you know what to do. Hit that like button. Click that subscribe button. Ring the bell so you don't miss the video. And I will see you next time. This is Chuck from Brand New Vegan. Thanks so much for watching.